Good day, everyone. This is Professor Friday from Macomb Community College coming at you one more time. I have had a special request for an overview of polar coordinates from one of my dear fraternity brothers from the Michigan State chapter. So, here we go. Overview of polar coordinates. Now, before we do that, we're going to do a quick recall. And we're going to talk about the Cartesian coordinate system. Or what we call... Rec this is the coordinate system that you've been told about for years and years. So I'm going to... Oh, wow. That's, um... Hmm. So that's some drawing. Let's try that one again. Here we go. All right. Close enough. So we got an x-axis and we got a y-axis. Now, in the rectangular coordinate system, what we have going on is any point in the Cartesian plane gets an x-coordinate as well as a y-coordinate. The significance of these is that this is the physical distance from the point to each of the axes. The distance from the point down to the x-axis is referred to as the value y, and the distance from the point to the y-axis is referred to as x. And the reason that we refer to it as a rectangular coordinate system is, well, if I could actually draw straight lines here, this forms a little rectangle for us. So we know this as the rectangular coordinate system. Now, how that relates to polar. Uh, any point in the Cartesian plane is given an ordered pair where we list the x-coordinate followed by the y-coordinate. Let's see how things work a little bit differently in polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, we will again draw in our x-axis and our y-axis. Polar coordinates still have these. But this time, if we want to reference a point, we still use two numbers to determine its position. However, we know those two numbers as r and theta. r refers to the distance from the origin to the point. Theta is the angle that gets formed with the positive x-axis. In trigonometry, we would have called this an angle that is in standard position. So here's theta down here. In addition, we can have certain angles that are coterminal to theta that still describe the same point. Now what I'd like to do is use both of these definitions, the rectangular coordinate system as well as the polar coordinate system, and I'm going to put them together in the same graph. And we're going to see if we can actually draw this with some straight lines this time. Well, straight lines, close enough. X-axis, Y-axis, and a point. Points in the Cartesian plane, we know this as two different things. This can either be XY, or we'll use red for the polar coordinates. This is R theta. So again, in terms of the rectangular coordinate system, we can draw in a reference line down to the x-axis. This is known as y, and this distance along the x-axis is known as x. And in polar coordinates, if we connect with a straight line like so, this is known as r, and this is known as theta. Trigonometry students everywhere would recognize this as an angle in standard position, and we probably recognize the use of the x and the y and the r, as well as our reference angle theta. So a couple things about polar coordinates. One of them is converting between coordinate systems. Converting between coordinate systems. To talk about converting between coordinate systems, first thing we're going to do is reference a little bit of right triangle trigonometry up here, since we have something that's in quadrant one here. First thing I'd like to point out is what the sine and the cosine of theta are equal to. The sine of theta, if we think back to Sokotoa, uh, sine would be the opposite over the hypotenuse. This would be y over r. In addition, we also have the cosine of this angle. The ka of Sokotoa tells us that this is the adjacent side over the hypotenuse. That would be r over, or excuse me, x over r. Now with a little bit of algebra, we can convert those two expressions into the following. If we are given polar coordinates, so given r and theta, 
the way that we calculate what x and y are equal to is from these two formulas. x would be equal to, if we multiply both sides of this by r, we get r times the cosine of theta. And if we take the expression involving the sine of theta and we multiply both sides by r, we get that y is equal to r times the sine of theta. Now this conversion from polar to Cartesian is unique. If I give you an r and a theta, there is only one possible x and one possible y. It's the only way that it can possibly work. So, what if I gave you a point in the Cartesian plane with x's and y's and said, find the corresponding value of r and theta? Well, a couple different possibilities there. Let's come up with a new graph and give it the old college try. Uh, not bad. So here's a point in the Cartesian plane, and this time we're going to use just the r and the theta. So if I know what x and y are, the question is, how do I get r and theta? Well, if I draw in my reference triangle one more time, here's y, here's x, we can obtain r using the Pythagorean theorem. So given x and y, we can calculate r using the Pythagorean theorem. Pythagorean theorem states that the square of the hypotenuse is the sum of the squares of the lengths of the legs. So r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. In addition, the only trigonometric function that's going to involve both an x and a y would be either the tangent or the cotangent. So we'll make use of the fact that the tangent of theta is equal to y over x and say tangent of theta is equal to y over x. Now this gives us a lot of possibilities for theta because theta is a periodic thing. We could loop around a couple of times before winding up at an angle that is coterminal to theta. So the use of r and theta is not unique in polar coordinates. For example, let's say that I want to reference a point in the Cartesian plane not drawn to scale, but whatever, that's fine. This point I'm going to say is the point 1, comma, the square root of 3. What I'm curious is how we can describe that in polar coordinates. So first off, we've got that x is equal to 1, y is equal to the square root of 3. So to calculate r, we could say r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Plug in the values for x and y that we have. So r squared is equal to 1 squared plus square root of 3 squared. Simplifying that gives us r equals 4. Now normally we'd say take the square root of both sides and we can say r is equal to plus or minus 2. Now we know r is generally the radius of a circle and so r is always supposed to be a positive value. Is that necessarily true for polar coordinates? Absolutely not. Going from the origin to this point, I have two possibilities. I'm going to draw in what the rest of the line would look like if I go through the origin. I have two possibilities. I can turn this far, which we'll call theta, and then walk in a straightforward line, or I could turn all the way around like this and start walking backwards. So, the fact that r can be negative just indicates us moving backwards if we were facing in this direction over here in quadrant 3. So with that in mind, let's figure out a couple possibilities for the, uh, the value of theta. Now we said on the last sheet that the tangent of theta is equal to y over x, so for us, y over x would be square root of 3 over 1, or we could just call that square root of 3. Thinking back to our unit circle, this occurs in quadrant 1 when theta is equal to pi over 3 radians. Pi over 3 radians, or 60 degrees. So what this means for us is if we're starting at the origin, if we are located at the origin facing in the direction of the positive x-axis, we can rotate by 60 degrees, or pi over 3 radians, and then walk straight forward by a total of two units to arrive at this point. This is not the only possibility for our angle here. I'm going to write the first possibility up here. So 2, comma, pi over 3. 
We said that another possibility was to rotate ourselves into quadrant 3 and then start walking backwards. Well, what would that angle look like in quadrant 3? Because it forms a straight line, we can take our pi over 3 radians and add a straight angle to that, that'd be adding pi to it. That would put us at 4 pi over 3. So another possibility for this angle is we say, starting from the origin, we rotate around, rotate around into quadrant 3, like so, and then we start walking in the backwards direction. If we rotate into quadrant 3, we'd be at an angle of 4 pi over 3, and if we walk negative 2 units, we would arrive at the point in Cartesian coordinates that we call 1 comma square root of 3. Now really, there is a periodic property at work here. So the other possibility that we can write down is that this point is 2 comma, we said pi over 3, but that also works for any angle that is coterminal to pi over 3. We would refer to that as 2k pi, where k is any integer. We can also say that this point can be described by negative 2 comma 4 pi over 3. Using our periodic property again, we say plus 2k pi. That is again where k is any integer, positive integer or negative integer. So in Cartesian coordinates, what we would call 1 comma square root of 3 is equal to either one of these possibilities. This is just a little overview of the conversion between Cartesian coordinates and polar coordinates. Mitchell, I sincerely hope that you found this helpful. I uh, look forward to another one of these videos soon. See you soon.